Hello and welcome to the Sky Reef Sanctuary and You. This is part of an ongoing series of deep dives into various aspects of the board game Kingdom Death Monster. My name is Fen and today we are looking at the Sunstalker's crafting location, the Sky Reef Sanctuary. The Sunstalker is my favourite first generation monster. I think it's the gold standard for that first batch of monsters that came out with the initial Kickstarter and I think it kind of demonstrated the direction that things have gone further on down the line. So first thing to note is Skyrim Sanctuary provides gear that's really thematically and mechanically tied to the Sunstalker itself. So the Sunstalkers are a combination of a cephalopod, um, so octopus, squid, cuttlefish, that kind of thing. They have a lot of the Dumbo octopus about their appearance, but they're blended with a shark and then thematically and mechanically, they're also built into this concept of being like our nearest star, the sun. Now, of course, the sun isn't particularly special as far as stars go. Um, and this isn't the only star-based monster. The Dragon King has a lot of links to stars um, itself as well. Um, but the Sunstalker is more like that concept of soul, of our giver of life, of our nearest star um, so it has more of the mythological connections rather than the scientific ones that the dragon king tends to uh, demonstrate of course the dragon king as well is a godzilla homage so yeah so when it comes to the mechanical themes of the sunstalker it's playing around with light darkness um, and the idea of prismatic light white light so you're going to see a bit of the affinity kind of things, but the Phoenix, for example, leans into one of each affinity as being a, like the rainbow. This kind of leans more into all affinities, white affinities, so to speak, uh, and it does it in an incredibly competent way. Before we get into the gear, we're just going to quickly look at a couple of uh, cards up here. So first up we have the Salt Sculptures. This is the terrain card that will go in your deck uh, when you are when you have the Sunstalkers and available quarry. It is a way of gathering salt if you can get yourself into darkness. We will talk about how you're in darkness a little bit further down the line. But these appear as well, two of them in the Sunstalker Showdown. Um, they're on the far end of the showdown board. You should be going to grab both of them because salt is quite important as a crafting resource. We'll look at it in a second. Uh, we also have this. There's two innovations that go that that are generally available when um, hunting the Sunstalker. Uh, this one goes into the deck. It's a hovel um, consequence home one. You're only allowed to endeavour here if a survivor died during the last hunt or showdown. You spend one endeavour, you roll a dice, on a 1 to 5 you get plus 3 insanity and random fighting art. On a 6 plus you gain the sneak attack fighting art which we will take a look at right now. Uh, okay, so if we just have a quick... Uh, oh, there we go. This is sneak attack. Uh, so when you attack a monster from the blind spot you gain plus 4 strength for that attack. Plus four strength is not to be sneezed at. Um, so this isn't terrible to roll on. It's kind of a consolation prize for losing a survivor. Um, this means Shadow Dancing isn't a particularly high priority, but it's probably worth triggering when you do have the, um, the trigger available and you have Endeavor's Spare. So just remember it exists. Uh, it also doesn't add anything more to the deck, but it does go in when you pick the Hovel innovation and that can bloat your innovation deck a little bit so just be aware that the sunstalker makes hovel a little bit worse overall um, with a kind of slightly below average uh, innovation here in shadow dancing but sneak attack is no slouch right uh, okay so let's take a real quick look at the resources we're going to start over here with our um, strange resources. So sunstones, 1,000 year sunspot, and 3,000 year sunspot are gained by fighting the increasing level of sunstalkers. So level one, level two, level three. There, you're going to find that the resource requirements on these ask you to make some decisions about either hunting the same level multiple times 
or making sacrifices. So that is interesting in itself. We'll look at them individually as they turn up, but there's a bit of thought about it. Then we have salt. Salt is used in a lot of crafting recipes, as we you can see it multiple times over here. I'm kind of all, here we are, see there and here. It can also add it to any cooking recipe to gain a permanent plus and strength in addition to the recipe's listed benefits. I would recommend you wait until you finish crafting before chucking salt in. Plus one strength is nice, but gear is better because gear survives if a if it's where it dies. I was gonna say gear survives if a survivor dies. Yeah, that sounds good. Anyway, right. So then we have our resources. The Sunstalker has a lot of one-offs. We've got uh, five of these. We got three of these huge sun teeth, and it should be three small sun teeth, and then two shadow tentacles, and then all of the rest of these are one-offs. So something to bear in mind if you've got a specific crafting goal that you're aiming for, watch out for these uh, because you you don't want to be using them generically. Uh, if you can avoid it, uh, unless you've already made what you're looking for. So, let's get into the actual gear, shall we? And we will start with the armor set. So, cycloid scale. Uh, every single piece has two armor points for its given location. The armor set and scale keywords. And we'll look at the layout and the set bonus afterwards. We'll start with the hood. So, this is whenever you spend a your, your knight movement. Uh, the scales color shift and you gain plus one evasion to your next act. So this is okay. Cycloid scale can lean into evasion builds fairly well, but because of the low armor points it has, this is less effective than it could be. We'll talk about cycloid scales sort of main uses when we look at the set as a whole. But this is just, it's nice to have and the downward facing blue is, is just pretty standard. Uh, affinity for a hood piece, for a headpiece, so that's pretty good. Next we have the cycloid scale sleeves. So this is one of the two huge things that cycloid scale does. Cycloid scale sleeves have a left and right facing, oh, you know, crafting costs. So before we get into it, cycloid scale hood costs one cycloid scales one hide and one prismatic gills. There's only one prismatic gills in the deck, so watch out for that. Now we'll get on to the cycloid scale sleeves, which their crafting cost is one cycloid scales, one bone, one small sun teeth, and one salt. So this is part of why I'm like, watch out for salt. Now let's get on to what I was saying, which is cycloid scale sleeves with have a left facing blue and a right facing blue, and they have this ability. So when you shadow walk, that's an ability on the jacket, we'll look at it in a moment, and attack the monster from its blind spot, your weapon gains plus one accuracy and sharp for that attack. So this is the assassin theming to Cycloid Scale. This is a really good piece of gear. Now it doesn't do anything without the jacket, so if you're looking to use Cycloid pieces in a mixed set, you're going to need to employ the sleeves and the jacket. But what this does is it takes any weapon that doesn't have sharp, sticks sharp onto it, and effectively you have plus two accuracy because you're in the blind spot, plus three because uh, you would, if you're wearing the full set, you'd definitely have this bonus active, which we'll look at in a moment. And just it can do so much to pull weapons that have interesting abilities but bad strength and make them really viable. You can leverage almost anything, so you could say use a Zanbato and be like, now it has sharp as well, which is fine, that's perfectly acceptable. My preference is to take weapons that usually uh, struggle in the mid game and add that sharp so that between one and 10 strength or 5.5 strength on average, five to six strength, and really make the, the weapon sing. So, just to list a few favourites, in the core game, I think the Skull Cap Hammer and the Whistling Mace both greatly benefit from this. Um, they are interesting abilities with bad strength. Uh, in the Gorm, the Acid Tooth Daggers are a wonderful candidate. They have an incredible ability, but whenever you fail to perfect hit with them, then you know, you're know you not rolling with particularly high strength. This helps with that. And Whips, Whips is another one 
I think having sharp on whips makes a huge difference. And whips do a awful lot that nothing else does do. So the silk whip and the hunter's whip in particular, but the rawhide whip is not bad here. It's a little messy to use because cycloid isn't really a tanking set, but it's worth remembering it's an option. And as we'll see later on, you can even handle the priority token in an interesting manner if you want to. So ultimately, if you've got a weapon that you're you're brewing around and you're like, I really, really think this weapon is great and interesting, but it kind of has a bad strength or even bad strength and bad accuracy. Cycloid scale can change that for you. And the sleeves is a big part of that. OK, then we have the cycloid scale jacket. This costs one cycloid scales, one scrap, one huge sun teeth and one salt. So again, we can see that salt really important. Uh, it has an up facing blue, which will connect to the hood, a left facing red and a right facing red. It has an affinity ability. If you connect the up facing blue and have two red affinities anywhere on your gear grid, you'll get plus one accuracy. So this will go on top of the cycloid scale sleeves accuracy. And its general ability is whenever you spend your night, your movement, you shadow walk, and you may move through spaces survivors occupy without causing collision. So of course that also means you've ticked the box for the cycloid scale sleeves. It kind of encourages you to do a little dance back and forth in the monster's blind spot. If the monster isn't moving, that is. Usually you can't run like multiple survivors because juggling the blind spot for a two by two monster can be a little awkward uh, but bigger monsters have the space for you and because you can actually walk through other survivors without causing collision that's um or move through them that's kind of quite relevant walking around a survivor at times it's a lot of extra movement spaces as opposed to just two if you can move through their space so cycle scale jacket is centerpiece of the set it does a lot of what you need it to do it triggers other bits and pieces it's really a, a great thing and um, when it comes to mixed sets these this is two of the pieces that I would consider putting like if I'm going to use the scale sleeves and why would I not I have to take the jacket along as well. Uh, right, then we have got the uh, waist piece. So the cycloid scale skirt uh, costs one cycloid scales, one hide and one huge sun teeth. It has an up facing blue and a down facing green. If you puzzle connect the green and have three more blue affinities on your gear grid, then when you depart, you gain survival equal to the number of blue affinities you have. So. That's going to be a minimum of three blue once you've got this active, and it can go even further up. The survival when departing is really helpful. Large amounts of survival when departing, really great. The only survival gains that I think are better are survival gains on arrival at the showdown. Um, but this is just a lot of survival on a single piece of gear. However, I'm going to say this is kind of the least impressive piece of the whole set. It's nice, but it's kind of like you know, the, the butter on your sandwich, or even the bread. It's it's not the thing that you're super excited about, but you are not disappointed to have it there. Last of all, we have these cycloid scale shoes. These cost one cycloid scales, one bone and one shadow tentacles. Remember, there's two copies of this in the deck. They have an up facing green, a left facing blue. And when you spend your night, um, so you don't have to move with this, Okay, you can use this ability here. You get a super version of Fecal Salve, which is uh, you're not a threat until you attack. Lovely. Uh, you have the priority target token. Uh, if you have it, sorry, then you will gain two survival and remove it. That's why I mentioned you can use the Rawhide Whip with this. So you can literally like use the Rawhide Whip plus Cycloid Scale to generate survival via the Cycloid Scale shoes if you want to. Just stand in one spot, go whipping it in its butt. But you know, Fecal Salve's really good. Fecal Salve on an armor piece is even better, and this is even better again. So it's a solid piece of gear, and all of the kit comes together to give us a fantastic piece, which we'll look at as a whole now. So let's go up to our gear grid. Here it is. Uh, right, so before we look at the layout, we'll start with the completed set bonus, because this is a big part of the picture. You get one armor point to all hit locations, meaning you're on three. This is very low for a node three monster. There was mention in one of the Kickstarter updates that this would get scaled up. 
Uh, there was a little bit of pushback about that. Um, I do think it would be okay for this to, this full set maybe to have an extra armor point on it and maybe each individual piece to have an extra armor point. I wouldn't want to see more than four or five armor on each hit location because of how good this is as an aggressive armor set. But the other really impressive thing, and this is why I like to call this the, the like, build brewer's armor kit is this prismatic ability so wording's a little wonky on here but it is further explained and clarified in the rule book so it is easy to understand once you read that and just wrap your head around it prismatic your complete affinities and incomplete affinity halves count as all colors what this is saying is this here this blue affinity is also a green affinity and a red affinity on top of that though it's also saying that each of these half affinities is all colors. So here, this connects. And this is a blue affinity, a green affinity, and a red affinity. That means any gear that's asking for combinations, large amounts of affinities, you can use cycloid scale to get you most of the way there. This is typical layout here. It has one, two, three, four affinities, which means it has four red, four blue, and four green as a baseline. And we've even got another easily connectable affinity here. And it, again, it doesn't matter what color it is. You can just, as long as you connect, that's another affinity. This is fantastic for getting all sorts of pieces of gear active. If you've ever had that thing where you've looked at two pieces of gear and you've been like, I wish I could just get enough affinities on my gear grid to make both of these work together, this can do it. You want a blue charm? Just put a blue charm on here, it's active. You know, blue charm plus spear plus cycloid scale armor, that's a classic build there. The possibilities are kind of endless. Uh, you also have room to move these things around quite well. You could put any sort of thing in the various different spots. This is just the most convenient layout because it ensures all the puzzle affinities are connected before you start plugging anything else in. But again, as long as you have the affinities, you don't care what color they are, you just care about connecting them. So super good armor set. The reason I haven't demonstrated any particular builds on here is because there are so many different things you can do with it that I, I you know, at some point maybe I'll do a look into like mid game hunting parties and discuss the DPS um, damage dealing builds for Psycho Scale, but there's a huge amount of them. So just bear it in mind. I will say Cycloid Scale is not an armor set really for reach or ranged weapons. It cares so much about being in the blind spot that ranged weapons tend to be cumbersome, so it's awkward to get into that blind spot in the first place. And also it doesn't like sharp weapons because it's providing sharp itself. This makes it a, a super good partner for Dragon King gear because a lot of the Dragon King, key, Dragon King weapons are lousy when it comes to strength but have interesting abilities and putting sharp on them solves a lot of problems so there's a lot you can do with this armor set the sunstalker is phenomenal at opening up a campaign uh, and giving you access to a whole bunch of weird and wacky things that you possibly couldn't have done before and that's why it's very hard to argue against not including this in every campaign except for of course people of the sun where thematically and mechanically it doesn't make any sense. Right, let's get on to the pieces of gear. I have ordered them in a specific way, mostly following the crafting location, but I've put the prestige stuff near the back, like the specific level unlocks. We're gonna start with, I think one of the best pieces of design in the entire game. Um, and while I do praise this, I want to point out, from an interview, Adam indicated that he's the sole designer of the Sunstalker. I'm paraphrasing, so my memory may not be completely correct, but I believe he locked himself away in his office for a week and came up with this by the end of it all. It, this is Adam at his best. Like This is such a really well done, uh, exciting expansion as a whole and fantastic crafting location. And this is a really great example of it. So the Sunspot Dance cost one Sunstones, so that's this strange resource, you'll get one for defeating the level one Sunstalker, and three Bone. Pretty reasonable crafting cost. It's a weapon ranged and thrown. And I, I do have to highlight it's a thrown weapon, and I've mentioned that I feel thrown weapons tend to suffer because they don't have a weapon proficiency. The Sunspot Dart is absolutely an exception to that and we'll get into it as we break it down. 
So, as a right-facing red affinity, that's nice. It just it's it's useful. Uh, it's range five. It's deadly, and has an activation limit of three, which means you can use it three times a showdown. It has four speed, seven plus accuracy, and three strength. So, this strength is low for a weapon that's coming from a node three monster, but it's got deadly, so you want to pay attention to that. However, the big thing about this is the sunspot dart is not strictly speaking a weapon. What you care about with the Sunspot Dart is its ability that triggers on hit. So when you hit, there is an inspiring flash and survivors adjacent to the monster gain plus one survival. Seven plus is about a 40% hit chance. Let's put you in the blind spot because you can move. So we'll say 50%. That means you're going to hit two out of four. That's two hits. That's two survival per adjacent survivor. If we have all the survivors adjacent to the monster, which is very doable, then that means just one activation of this on average from the blind spot is going to be a gain of two survival per survivor, eight survival. And you can do this three times. So that's like an average result. Potentially, you can hit with all four and then suddenly each survivor is gaining four survival each and that could be up to 16 survival. That's what the Sunspot Dart's biggest thing is. It's a huge pool of survival regain tagged into a weapon. And the negative is, of course, it's a low strength weapon. You're going to have to deal with reactions after you've attacked. That could be painful, but you do have deadly to offset that to a certain degree. So in survival is like one of the best resources a survivor can have during the showdown because once you've got all your survival actions unlocked, it's an encourage, it's a, it's avoiding a hit with a dodge, it's moving around with a dash, it's attacking with a surge, it's whatever campaign specific survival actions you may have. It's amazing. And this is so much survival all baked into a single thing that can also sometimes score critical wounds and bypass reactions generate resources. It's just really good. I have no notes about this beyond my usual complaint of wanting a thrown weapon proficiency to be in the game. Fantastic. Speaking of fantastic, the Sunshark Bow is my favourite weapon in the entire game bar none. This costs two huge sun teeth, an organ, one sun shark bone, sun shark bone, and one salt. The sun shark bone, uh, in addition to being a little bit of a tongue twister, is a one of in the deck, um, right there. This is a weapon melee ranged bow two-handed. Yes, that's right, it's melee and ranged. It has sharp and range one, so you can only use it adjacent to the monster baseline. Uh, it has three speed, six plus accuracy and zero strength, but remember how sharp. Or, if you connect the puzzle affinity and you get yourself three, uh, two extra red affinities for a total of three red, it gains plus four strength and slow, which changes it to a one, six, plus four weapon. So, you've got like two modes you can choose to run the Sun Shark Bow in. The thing is, Bow and Melee is a really good combination. Suddenly, this bow can make use of all of the monster movement abilities that are stuck on pieces of armor. It can take advantage of all the melee synergies and any range synergies. You can carry like an extra arrow in your gear grid, or as we're gonna see, um, you can combine it with a quiver and sunstring to do some really funky and interesting stuff. It's just so flexible. This is Kingdom Death's Gun Lance, which is from Monster Hunter, and that is a lance with a gun stuck on it. This is a bow with a huge teethed blade on the front of it. This is my favourite frontline tanking weapon and I'm always hoping to draw a Sunshark a bone so I can craft this because it just makes me happy to use it. Uh, it, it is not a typical bow weapon, it's a close range affair. Um, and there's a little more modification we can do to it which we'll get to in two items. First of all, we have the Sun Shark Arrows. They are they cost three small sun teeth, one bone, one sun shark fin, um, and a salt. They're a item ammunition arrow and soluble. Watch out for soluble. Um, the Sunstalker likes to evaporate soluble gear. It has sharp as well, 
Nice. Ammo bow, of course, it's ammo. Uh, activation limit three, you can use this three times a showdown. Again, you use tokens to track it. It's got one speed, four plus accuracy, and six strength. You wouldn't use this with the Sun Shark bow, um, but a sharp arrow at six strength is pretty impressive. The only reason the Sun Shark arrows ever fell down a little bit in the rankings is because the White Giga Lion brought along an arrow that was kind of well it was strictly better and then it got nerfed to have cumbersome it's still mostly better than the sun shark arrows so in my opinion um this is a must craft if you don't have the white giga lion you can maybe skip on it to use the salt elsewhere if you do have access to the white giga lion it's just really good um ju just an excellent arrow all round three shots at the equivalent of 11 to 12 strength is really solid okay now we have another one of my favorite um, gear cards in the game. This is the Quiver and Sunstring. It requires an inner shadow skin. There's only one of those in the deck. Four hide, one brain root, another one of, and one salt. Salt again. This is an item leather scale with a left facing red and a right facing blue. It has the ability of you may carry up to three arrow gear cards outside of your grid. All arrows you must carry must be different. And with you have a red and two blues, all your bows gain plus two range. So that can make the Sun Shark Bow a three range weapon, making it a short range like combating weapon. That is super interesting when you combine it with stuff like Phoenix Armor and Dragon King Armor because suddenly you have a range three melee weapon that you can use with your huge strength monster movement type abilities. So that's a synergy to watch out for. But also this is slot compression. This takes one arrow and effectively turns it into three which is really, really, really useful, even if you're not able to get the plus two range. But that plus two range, like increasing the range on the arc bow, which is a very long range weapon anyway, is amazing. And having all those extra slots while still getting to carry three arrows is nothing to um, sneeze at at all. So absolutely save your brain root and your inner shadow skin to craft this. Quick note, does not synergize with the Dragon King Shielded Quiver because that requires the arrows to be in your gear grid. This has them being outside of the gear grid. As for what arrows I'll typically take, definitely going to take the Hollow Point Arrow if I've crafted that and likely the Claw Head Arrow from the White Lion and then one more, maybe Sun Shark Arrows, maybe Gloom Arrows, depends really. But yeah, I mean, this is just so very, very, very good. Absolutely love it. Right. Now we have the Shadow Saliva Shawl. This costs one Shadow Ink Gland. That's another one of. Four high, uh, sorry, one salt, one stink lung, and a shark tongue. So to reiterate that, it's one Shadow Ink Gland, one salt, one stink lung, and one shark and it's an item balm stinky other. It's an up facing and down facing green. It gives you plus two evasion, but you're not allowed to wear this if you have heavy, soluble or shield keyword gear or any gear with three or higher base armor points printed on it. Uh, it has an additional ability of puzzle green, puzzle green, 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 plus one evasion, all weapons gain slow. Quick note, tools like the pickaxe, are not weapons so that's a fun little thing you can go around also doesn't matter if you're putting slow onto a weapon that already has slow ultimately this is an alternative to monster grease It's specifically designed you can't use it with monster grease because soluble uh, I think this is a fantastic piece of gear for lighter armor sets like the Cycloid Scale armor which only has a base of two armor points. But also, you know, you can use it with Rawhide armor, you know, there's a bunch of other areas. Even if you're not activating this fully, it is very, very strong and you'll even see it in some pretty fun and crazy like heavy green affinity builds like Acanthus Doctors and things like that. This is hardish to craft takes a bit of time and effort to put together it's absolutely worth it and it is it, it, it's like like every single piece of gear in this crafting location it's great that's the biggest problem you have here is you've got a cornucopia of options they're all amazing 
and generally you're just looking to see what, I, what do I get out of the resource deck to let me to craft these various different things and how can I leverage them. Then we have the Sky Harpoon. This costs one Sunshark Bone, so a little bit of competition there against the Sunshark Bow. And also one Scrap and one Salt. It's a Weapon Melee Thrown Spear with a left facing red affinity. It has Reach 3, the highest reach value we currently have printed on any weapon, or at least any first generation weapon. Savage. Uh, and once per showdown, if the monster's within reach, so within three spaces, you roll 1d10 on a 6 plus, you skewer it, it suffers one wound and moves up to three spaces towards you. So, as I've talked about before, automatic wounds that skip the hit location deck are unicorns in this game. Even a 50% one is very interesting, especially when it's on a weapon with two speed, five plus accuracy, and five strength that also has additional synergies. So, this is a thrown weapon, currently, there's not many synergies that that plays into well but it's a spear spears are a fantastic weapon type it doesn't have sharp naturally so it can be used with cycloid scale armor fairly well it's also phenomenal with phoenix armor and dragon armor and any other kind of move and attack armor set like crimson crocodile or white lion or especially screaming antelope which has additional spear synergies it's really super interesting and powerful weapon but it has an additional little extra hidden perk that we're going to talk about when we get to its companion item which is here. This is the Sun Lure and Hook. Uh, it costs one Sun Sharp Blubber and one Scrap to make. It is an item and a tool. It has a downward facing blue affinity. When you depart you gain plus one survival and after the hunt phase you can play Sky Fishing event on any hunt space. So Sky Fishing! It works just like Mineral Gathering, just like Herb Gathering. So it's another uh, special hunt event that you'll put on a track. When you trigger it, you'll go to this little event here. So you inflate the lure and gently launch it into the air. It floats through the darkness and the group nervously waits. After time, you feel a bite. When you feel a bite, you nominate the survivor with a uh, sun lure and hook and roll 1d10. You get plus two if you have a sky harpoon in your gear grid. First things first, always have a Sky Harpoon in your gear grid, because 1 and 2 on this table kills you, so let's not roll that, shall we? The rest of the results, you've got 3, 4, 5, uh, will give you the Bugfish Strange Resource and 2 Bleeding Tokens. 6, 7, 8 will give you the Hagfish Strange Resource. Uh, 9, 10 and 11 will give you Jowls, our fun little movie reference, and plus 2 Survival. And on a 12+, plus, you have an option to either archive your harpoon or to roll on a table. You would archive your harpoon because on a one or a two, you will die. And dying on the hunt phase is bad. So you probably want to make sure you have a lifetime re-roll or maybe something like otherworldly luck to help influence this roll further. On a one to ten, you're dead. There's a compensation of some insanity, but that's not worth it. On a three to six, uh, two random event damage to each survivor and you gain an iron. That's a good trade. That is a good trade. Uh, on a 7+, plus, you'll get a fish resource of your choice. Amazing. And you can then place uh, the survivors on absolutely any space on the hunt board not occupied by your quarry, meaning you can skip most of the rest of the hunt and get right to the fight once you've resolved every single special hunt event that you want to resolve really really useful but there is one additional thing um, and it's these these fish resources so here they are you've got the bug fish which is a fish and organ consumed to get plus two survival uh, if there's some there's something in its belly you gain a random vermin resource and you have to consume that immediately and then you archive this card don't do that don't do that keep it as an organ save it uh, the first one's really 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 valuable we'll look at why in just a moment You've got the hagfish, which is a fish, bone, and a hide. So, nice. Nice having a hide and a bone together. Uh, consume, your hair turns grey and you gain plus one hunt XP and archive this card. Usually, not really worth consuming at all, but definitely don't consume the first one, just don't do it. Then we have jowls. Um, when you gain jowls, you hum the jaws theme and it bites off your nose. If you have no nose, you die. So, what this is basically saying is once you've caught a jowls, you lose your nose and you cannot, cannot... Uh, risk catching another jowls or you'll die 
um, but you know you can move the sky harpoon onto somebody else, and they can and with the sun lure, and they can take over the job of fishing after that. So effectively, one jowls per survivor maximum. If you have jowls, hagfish, and bugfish, you're inspired, and you may archive all three to gain the filleting table innovation. This is your first goal. You want to be doing that with these first three. And that is because the filleting table is a science innovation that you can only get through this method of it archiving. Once per settlement phase, if the return survives victorious, you gain a random basic resource. Earlier you get this, the better. The more basic resources you get, the better. Now, when you get a lot further into the campaign, you, if you're doing well, you should have a lot of resources anyway. But the key thing here is... More basic resources means more chance that the rarer stuff in the basic resource deck like Love Juice, Perfect Resources and Skulls if you're looking for skulls for a certain Gloomhammer. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal thing and I actually think it's worth trading in these first three resources to start doing this. It will pay for themselves. After that your main goal is to try and get Jowls, Jowls is, a, um, a school of Jowls. But uh, remember, just don't mess up with the nose thing, because uh, it's an embarrassing way to go out to a fish during the hunt event. Last of all, on the filleting table, you can uh, activate it for advanced cutting. On a 1 to 5, you cut your own arm off. <sighs> yeah, not, not great. On a 6 plus, you get the trick attack fighting art, which is here. It's a once per showdown when you wound a monster from the blind spot. It's 5 adjacent to you may gain the priority target token. So I don't think trick attack's particularly good. You have to be in the blind spot, which means the other survivor is behind the monster at least. So likely not somebody who wants to have the priority target token. And it's a once per showdown thing. I don't generally see much point in, in using advanced cutting. Manipulating the monster's AI with priority target tokens can be very strong. There are better ways of doing it than this. So for the most part, the filleting table you want for this passive ability, which is very, very good. Okay, so we've got a few more pieces of gear to look at. And each and every single one of these requires one of those specific resources from a given level. Now, remember the sunstones were needed for making the sunspot dart. You also need them to make the sunspot lantern, which requires two sunstones, a scrap and a salt. And if you're planning to make the ink blood bow, uh, so, or, and especially the ink sword, you're probably gonna wanna craft one of these. You can get away without a sunspot lantern with the bow, but with the ink sword, you absolutely categorically need this. So it is an item, Lantern, left facing, right facing green. It passively gives you plus one accuracy, which is always nice. And you cast a one space shadow directly away from the monster. If the shadow could be cast in two spaces, you decide which space it has until you move. This is using the light and shadow effect that is present in the Sunstalker showdown. It currently doesn't work exactly as it's supposed to because shadows don't do anything mechanically by themselves. You need this card in play. I think one of the um, one of the gambler's chest cards uses shadow and actually remembers to put this into play. So I don't usually like pay attention to the unofficial, semi-official kind of quote-unquote house rules, but I do believe the sunspot lantern is supposed to put light and shadow in play. Otherwise, it kind of doesn't work outside of when you're fighting the Sunstalker, which means the Ink Sword doesn't work outside of fighting the Sunstalker because the Ink Sword requires Light and Shadow to be able to work. I imagine in Campaigns of Death we're going to see an updated version of this, and I'm going to go ahead talking about the Ink Sword and the Sunspot Lantern under the assumption that it is working in that way and it is casting that shadow. If it doesn't, well, we can drop the Ink Sword down in like viability rankings and the Sunspot Lantern becomes something that's not really worth worrying about because it's just plus one accuracy at the cost of resources that could let you make Sunspot Darts. Lantern keyword does have relevance though in People of the Lantern. So the big thing here is working correctly with Light and Shadow, it will put a shadow in a space behind you 
and that shadow space will allow a survivor to stand in there and be in darkness. We'll come back to this. Our level 2 weapon options, well, crafting options, are both weapons, and these requ both require the 1000 year sunspot. The identical axe here needs one 1000 year sunspot, one salt, one black lens, one of in the deck, um, uh, one iron and one bone, and the sleever um, requires two 1000 year sunspots, one salt, one black lens, and one sun sharp bone. So this is what I'm talking about with how good and interesting the Skyrim Sanctuary is, because you've got two options here. I'm going to tell you they're both great, and you're being asked to pick. It's it's a difficult choice, or you're being asked to hunt the Sunstalker like three times to get both of them, which I don't think is really um, a sensible choice in the campaign. You should normally fight a level two maybe twice at most if and try and progress on forward. So I like how this this asks a question of you and there is no right answer we'll start by looking at the sleever so this is a weapon melee grand heavy two-handed bone with an up and down facing red there's two abilities the first one is on the first perfect hit of each attack this gains devastating one until the end of the attack the second ability is puzzle red plus red plus red three reds total it loses the heavy keyword that's nothing to sniff at. If you can do that, you should, because heavy is a mostly negative keyword. It has one speed, five plus accuracy, and ten strength, which is a fantastic profile. And I'd like to highlight something that is missing from this weapon that makes it truly unique. It's not slow. This is a non-slow grand weapon. That means you can run this with survivors who have additional speed and take advantage of increased chances of getting that perfect hit. The Sleever is personally my favourite grand weapon. I really love using it. Uh, it is absolutely a joy and I, I actually really appreciate that you can take heavy off it if you can because that's a nice benefit to have as well. In addition to that, there is a Sunstalker based pattern in the Gambler's Chest that will upgrade the Sleever further. It has an upgraded version, so that's super cool. Then we also have the Denticle Axe. This costs one 1000 year Sunspot, one Salt, one Black Lens, one Iron, and one Bone. Our weapon Melee Axe Scale has a Puzzle Affinity ability with a right facing red, a down facing blue. Puzzle blue, blue, blue. When attacking from the blind spot, the attack gains plus two strength, and the first successful wound attempt gains devastating one. Two speed, six plus accuracy, five strength. So you can already see how this axe is designed to work with a cycloid scale armor. It's really, really good. And, and again, I, I love this weapon. Um, denticles are like the abrasive spikes that are on shark skin. So that's like a nice little reference to shark skin. And I'd like to go back and just say I love the name Skleaver, Sky Cleaver, Skleaver. I love it so much. Like this is, these are great weapons. Everything about them makes me really happy. Denticle axe, as I said, it's an axe. Axe is a great weapon type and it's just a really, really good solid weapon but definitely better when used with cycloid scale armor. Skleaver has synergies with cycloid scale armor, but also works with a whole bunch of other things as well. Okay, we're on to the big, the big guns now. These last two items can only be crafted using resources from the level three Sunstalker, let me say the level 3 Sunstalker is no slouch. It is a fun and challenging fight. And the, these rewards are worth it. So <clears throat> we're going to start with the Inkblood Bow. This costs 1 3,000 year sunspot, 5 organs, 3 shadow tentacles, and an iron. You're going to need to fight at least 2, mo two Sunstalkers to get the required number of shadow tentacles. It is a weapon ranged bow two-handed other so no survivor, uh, no saviors can use it. It has range 7, deadly and cumbersome. It gains plus 1 strength for each bleed to bleeding token you have. It loses cumbersome when in darkness, that's what we talked about with the Sunspot Lantern but not important um, on a bow. Bows with cumbersome 
they get around cumbersome just fine. There's a load of different ways of dealing with it. it has two speed, seven plus accuracy, and eight strength. This is debatably the best bow in the game uh, right now. There's a more competition than there has been before. The Phoenix now has not one but two very good bows with the Heart Stop bow and the Arc bow. But the Inkblood bow is always in the conversation, especially if you're playing a build that leverages having more bleeding, which has become something that is even more viable now. The Gambler's Chest has given us a bleed-based armor set. But Deadly, Range 7, this is this just ticks so many boxes that I really like, and it is a phenomenal, phenomenal weapon. The fact that it functions without the Sunspot Lantern is also really a nice bonus on top of everything else. So, it is, like, all of these are great weapons and they're immense fun to use and they're all, they all make me very happy in a variety of different ways, but we're gonna get on to the one that makes me the happiest now. So, this is the Ink Sword. This costs one 3,000 year sunspot, four hide, one shadow ink gland, and an iron. It is a weapon melee sword fragile. It has reach three and deadly three. Four speed, four plus accuracy, four strength, and you may only attack while this is in with this while it is, you're in darkness. It has a down facing blue affinity, which, you know, they're right. That, that helps. Can connect up to let you do stuff with the lucky charm deadly three on a sword is pretty nutty true blade is a secret fighting art that is in the flower knight uh, expansion and in fact i'm just going to read uh what it does for you it gives you all swords in your gear grid gain deadly, that's not the bit we care about. You get plus three luck when attacking with a sword if you have the ghostly beauty and narcissistic disorders. Uh, there's a whole thing about having those and uh, unlocking True Blade and all that. We're not going to get into too much detail, but basically, deadly three is gangbusters. Plus three luck on top of that is now plus seven, uh, plus six luck, plus, you know one for the standard crit range and you could put a lucky charm in on top of that effectively ink swords decimate monsters now you can only do this while in darkness so you need that sunspot lantern you need that shadow cast and you need that shadow to count as being in darkness but when you do this sword just it is a delight to use if you've got somebody who wants to roll a ton of dice and deal a load of damage this is the sword to set them up with. And getting True Blade, which you can wear Vagabond armor, which I'll talk about at some point in the future, alongside True Blade and the Ink Sword, and you just have one of the most delightfully fun builds, which still does require, like it needs a separate survivor with a Sunspot Lantern to be in the right position. Uh, they can't be. Uh, you have to be within reach three to be able to attack with your um, slashing through the air, I, I don't even like what, what do you, how do you think this thing works is it like cutting through the very light or is it firing bits of ink off I have no idea is it chopping up the shadows maybe who knows but it is yeah this is if you've never played with an ink sword get yourself a campaign with a flower knight and aim to make yourself a true blade ink sword wielder and if you have Vagabond Armor, tag that on top as well, because Vagabond Armor works really well with True Blade. This is a... I'm, I'm, I'm excited just talking about this weapon. I love it so, so much. Um, even though it's incredibly... It's, it's such a journey to unlock, but it feels good. You, you've worked hard to get this, and you do have to have that, like, supporting survivor, maybe a tag or something, holding the lantern to keep it up and there's that constant danger that if they die you lose your in darkness and that in itself means the ink sword is never a guaranteed easy easy game kind of most of the time is but there's a little bit of risk and you've put a lot of effort into getting just a sword so yeah that's um 
that's the pinnacle of a very high mountain of incredible pieces of gear. So, uh, I mean, when we get to trying to summarise everything, it's all good. Look at what resources you get from the Sunstalker and plan accordingly. There's so many different builds you can make. Just ensure you grab the salt every time you can. Make sure you get a Sunspot Lantern if you want to be using the Ink Sword. If you're not going to use the Ink Sword, seriously consider the Sunspot Darts. Probably don't make both, both because I think hunting a level 1 Sunstalker three times is kind of overkill. But you might be forced into that if you're having some difficulty. Uh, yeah, it's everything's good here. It's very hard to tell you a priority list. Pick the things that you like the most. Um, go for them. And just enjoy exploring how much this crafting location opens up the game to a wealth of other synergies and other strategies and bits and pieces. This here, this is one of the high points of Kingdom Death. And that's without even getting into how interesting and exciting the monster is, how much fun the campaign is. Quick review, Sunstalker should be on everybody's purchase list because it's amazing. And, you know, until next time, if you're out there traveling through the darkness, maybe take a sunspot lantern with you, maybe even an ink sword, and happy hunting. <laughs>